In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, most glorious Trinity, we thank you for for your love. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ coming incarnate to, to free us of our sins, but to give us divine sonship. We ask that you bless us as a group, bless the parish and the church at large during this season of Lent. Especially, of course, we pray for the successor of Benedict XVI, that he would be a good, holy uh, leader for our church worldwide. We, uh, we ask that you bless our family members, our friends, and this particular this Bible study as we dive into the life of Christ so that we might know him more and therefore love him more. And as always, we dedicate our studies to the mother of our Lord as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so again, if you have your notes, we're just going to get right on started. Um, this first installment is entitled... Who is Jesus Christ? I also thought about entitling it, Who Do Men Say That I Am? Okay, as we're going to see coming, uh, coming up, well, in some, par- some part in the middle of the lecture. Uh, because if we have four weeks, we really have to lay the foundation. Who is Jesus Christ? Who do people say that he is? Who do you, who do I say that he is? Is he truly God or not? Because if he's not God then we should just pretty much pack it all up and go home, right? As I'm going to explain. But if he is God, our lives can change, and we can study the life of Christ in three basic sections, kind of following the the leadership of the catechism, but Pope Benedict XVI. We're going to look next week, starting with the mysteries of our Lord's infancy and hidden life, and then the next week after that will be the mysteries of our Lord's public life. And we'll finish it off with the Paschal mysteries. All right, his passion, death, resurrection, and his ascension. So it's going to be nice and clean cut, nice and organized. But today's lesson is very, very important because we want to establish the, the foundation of who he is. Because, again, if he's not God, why are we going to waste any more time um, studying his life? Okay. Now, I, I always like to recommend a couple of resources, just really, really quickly, um, some books that I recommend to enrich your study on the life of Christ. Number one, of course, Venerable Sheen's The Life of Christ, and that's the book that we're raffling off, so don't forget to put in a ticket, you might win it. Um, so I always recommend that one, that's a classic. I also recommend, especially for today's lesson, um, Peter Kreft's book, he's actually right here in Boston College, Dr. Kreft. Uh, the Handbook of Catholic Apologetics. He's got a great chapter in there on the divinity of Jesus Christ, on miracles, on the resurrection, and, and there's pretty much well, chapters on everything. So I really recommend that. That's really great to have in your library. And finally, for those of you who like to learn auditorially, you know, through CDs, the auditory way, we've got a CD set, Jesus of Nazareth, A Biblical Christology by Dr. Brant Petrie. We actually have it. It's over here. We have it in our audio resource library. You can borrow it for free. This is actually a college-level course. He gets into all the great details and goes over the life of Christ. He talks about all the different um, approaches to Christology. It's really good. So if you're in the car a lot, you want to pop it in your car driving around, then you can, by all means, borrow it. Just don't want to see a stampede, okay? You know, should be respectful. All right, because we only have one copy. So I just wanted to recommend that. Now, to get to today's agenda, right? Today's an overview of the lesson. Number one, we want to just briefly introduce, uh, well, the the topic, uh, who Jesus Christ is in terms of the good news, the good news, the gospel of our Lord. Then the whole bulk of the lecture, the lesson, the presentation will be, was Jesus really God? Was he really God? Did he say he was God? What did he mean when he said he was God? We're going to look at all of that. And we're going to lean, I should just say really quickly, I'm taking a lot of most of my material for today from Dr. Brant Petrie, as well as Dr. Kreft. Great stuff. I just hijacked it, really. It was just like, it's right there for me after all the rest. Like, yeah, I'll just take that and work with it. (laughs) And then finally, the conclusion. The conclusion. All right? Everyone with me? You excited? All right. Now, let me also say, I'm willing to bet everybody in this room believes Jesus is God. Amen? If you don't believe Jesus is God, I'm not going to embarrass you by asking you to raise your hand. So, (laughs) we all believe Jesus is God, but I'm also willing to bet that you know somebody, maybe someone in your family, who no longer believes that Jesus is God. Amen? Amen. 
You, that just typically happens, especially a lot of people say, well, my children don't practice anymore, my children don't go to church. And so we need to be able to explain the gospel, what it is, and we need to be able to defend the divinity of Christ, especially if we're going to talk about his life. That's why we're spending time today looking at this, okay? Now, let's dive right on in. One of the most beautiful passages about the gospel, about salvation through Jesus Christ, comes from Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. I quote this, I think, pretty much in every one of my classes. Paul says, when the fullness of time had come, right? When the fullness, when everything was prepared, the people of Israel, with the Roman Empire, the Pax Roma, when everything was prepared, the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children, or adoption as sons, sons and daughters. That is the goal. God had prepared everything, prepared history to send his son to redeem us. Why? Not just so our sins could be forgiven. That's important. But the goal of salvation, speaking in terms of the the positive aspect, is that we might be divinized. We might share in the divine nature. We might become children of God. That is the gospel. Now, if this is the gospel, we have to ask a very important question. Who is Jesus Christ? And Jesus asked this very same question to his apostles. All right, in Matthew chapter 16, this is actually the verses that come immediately before the great, You are Peter, and upon this rock I build my church. Okay, Where, where Peter is basically made the prime minister, the pope, of the church. They came to this district called Caesarea Philippi. It's up in the north, the north of Israel. Uh, And he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, well, various various answers. John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. In other words, there are various opinions. Who is Jesus Christ? Some say just a good rabbi. Of course, obviously, we know the Pharisees thought he was, you know, a bad man, right, deceiving the nation, and so on and so forth. But then Jesus gets personal, not just with the apostles, but I think with everybody, every living person. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Other people might have various opinions. Jesus is God, or he is just a good man. He's a good prophet, a good moral teacher. But ultimately, the point comes down to you. Who do you say that I am? And this is where Simon Peter answers, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. You are the, this is the, his first, the ma- first major profession of faith among the apostles. You are the Messiah. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then, of course, this is when Jesus says, You are Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. This is the confession of faith. This is the good news. And it's directed at each and every one of us. And so the church has a historical confession of faith. We don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, in terms of myth and fancy and fairy dust sprinkled it everywhere, like Zeus, right? Okay, Zeus coming down, and, or, or some other Hindu religion, uh, the gods coming down and taking, you know, we could get into all different theories, but this is a historical confession of faith. So Catechism 423, taking cue from the Gospels, describes all the historical circumstances about the incarnation. We believe and confess, the catechism says, that Jesus of Nazareth, born a Jew of a daughter of Israel at Bethlehem, at the time of King Herod the Great and the Emperor Caesar Augustus, a carpenter by trade, who died crucified in Jerusalem under the procurator Pontius Pilate during the reign of Emperor Tiberius, is the eternal Son of God made man. He came from God, descended from heaven, and came in the flesh. This is a historical confession of faith. It is rooted in history with all these details. Where he's born, who he was born of, his trade, he's a carpenter, who, uh, who um, well, sentenced him to die. All these different things. That's very, very important for us when we get to an analysis or the, the, we analyze the various possibilities of his claim of divinity that's very important and why so why is all this important okay someone could say all right you know well i believe that jesus is god or i don't really believe jesus is god he's a good man and that's good enough for me he's like confucius or buddha or muhammad or moses or any of these other main guys what's the big deal well dr kreft gives five reasons why this is a big deal Okay, number one, no other religion claims that God became incarnate in this way. 
Yeah, there are some variations, especially with Hinduism, where either God, you know, comes down as an takes an avatar. It's a little bit different, but in this, no other religion claims the incarnation like the Christian religion. And of course, I include Protestant uh, Christians as well. That is greatly significant. It distinguishes Christianity from every other world religion. Number two, this is the capstone of all the other Christian beliefs. All the other dogmas and doctrines that we have are rooted in the incarnation. Even the dignity of man, the goodness of creation, all these things that we believe as Catholics, as Protestant Christians together, are rooted in the incarnation. If Jesus is not God incarnate, nothing else matters. Nothing else that we believe makes any sense. If you want to look at the sacraments, you want to look at the church, you want to look at the saints, you want to look at the liturgy, you name it. Any aspect of the church, it is always in connection with the person of Jesus Christ. Very, very important. Number three, if true, the incarnation is the most important event in human history. Amen? I mean, think about it. If this is true, the incarnate God became man, nothing trumps that. Nothing trumps that. Even the Patriots winning the Super Bowl does not trump that. Or not going to the Super Bowl, for that matter. Right? So this is extremely important. Nothing else, everything else pales in comparison. Number four, if this is true, then your life, my life, everybody's life can be redeemed and transformed forever. Because look, we're all on a journey. We've all got our sin character flaws, we've all got our issues, our temptations, we all have our crosses. But through the incarnation, when Christ sort of elevates suffers, he makes suffering redemptive, we can be redeemed. Our sins can be forgiven. We can become children of God again. That's extremely powerful for those people who want it. Our li- and you go through the history of the church in Catholicism as well as even in, pro- in the Protestant, the various histories in Protestant denominations, people's lives are changed by Christ. And that's one of the greatest, most powerful arguments for the divinity of Jesus and the the power of Christianity. People's lives are transformed. Finally, if this is true, then we owe him our complete obedience. Amen? Amen? This is not so easy anymore. Because we take it for granted, the incarnation, we, just, we, we hear it all the time. But think about it, if God became incarnate, if Jesus Christ is God in the flesh... And he calls us to worship him, to love him, to serve him, and surrender everything to him. And by everything, I mean capital E, everything. We owe him that injustice. It's right and just, all right, as the, as the Mass says. So this is a very, very, very important topic. You can't talk about the life of Christ unless you get all of this down pat. So you all with me so far? Excellent. Now, let's dive in. Did Jesus really claim to be God? And in your notes, the bottom of page one going into page two, I've got some explicit and implicit claims of divinity. I'm taking this actually from Dr. Petrie's speaking notes. Um, and you can actually get all of his excerpts online. Great stuff if you're listening along with the CD sets of his class. Uh, but I've got the reference right there for you, brantpetrie.com. Um, I made a mistake. I wrote five explicit claims, but I think I only wrote down four. So we're just going to stick with four. And the other seven implicit claims of divinity, um, and rather, a lot of them, in my opinion, are very explicit. You can make that judgment for yourself. So the first thing that we have to know, like the first response, if someone says, when did Jesus say he was God? When did Jesus say he was divine? What would come, what is the first thing that should come out of your mouth? Or does come out of your mouth? I am. The I am phrase should be immediate now, okay? So when did he do this? The I am phrase. And it goes to John chapter 8, verse 56 through 58. Jesus is having a squabble, as usual, right, with the Pharisees. He's fighting with them, he's trying to convince them, and they're resisting him. And finally Jesus says, your ancestor Abraham rejected, uh, rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Now, in all of these different things we're going to look at, you can't understand the claim alone. You've got to look at the reaction as well. They picked up stones to throw at him because he blasphemed. Now, you know the phrase, I am. First off, he's claiming pre-existence, right? He knows, he has seen Abraham because before Abraham was, he existed. 
He was. Now, he's just not claiming pre-existence and therefore his divinity, but of course he is taking on the divine name of Yahweh unto himself, right? So if you remember, you go back in salvation history to Moses and the burning bush. Moses is tending the sheep of his father-in-law, Jethro. He comes up to this bush that's burning, right? You know the story. And he has this conversation with God. God says, you know, go to the people and tell them they're going to free, etc., etc. And Moses, always trying to find an excuse not to do it, like all of us, I suppose, sometimes. He says, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who am. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. Because God simply is. In philosophy and theology, we talk about God's, um, well, God's essence is his existence. God simply is. Yesterday, today, and forever. So that's why God says, I am. And what is the Hebrew for I am? Yahweh. Go tell the Israelites, Yahweh, which means I am sent you. So Jesus now, if you back up a second, Jesus says to the Pharisees before Abraham was, Yahweh. And they're ticked off. Like, what would you just say? They pick up thrones, they're going to stone him. No one can take the divine name of Yahweh into themselves. No one, they couldn't even write it, let alone speak it, let alone say that you are Yahweh. You see what I'm saying? This is so important. So did God, did Jesus explicitly say he's God? Absolutely, that's the first example. He said, I am. Next, in John chapter 10, verses 27 to 31, along the same lines, he claims to be one in being with the Father. One in being with the Father. He's fighting with the Pharisees again. And he says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. By the way, that in and of itself is an audacious claim. Who can give anybody eternal life but God, right? So he says, I give them eternal life and they'll never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else. And no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. So what do they do? How do they react? Where are those stones? Where are those stones? we got to stone this man. He's blaspheming again. You can't say you're one with God. Come on. Unless you are, of course. So that is an explicit claim to divinity. Number three, Jesus claims to be David's Lord. Who is the greatest figure in Israel? The king, right? No one's greater than the king. And so Jesus, knowing this, trying to trump those Pharisees again, of course he did, He says, now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. Because the whole time prior to this, the Pharisees were trying to stump Jesus, asking Jesus all these questions. So Jesus said, what do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? The Pharisees said, God, this is easy. This is like the Jerusalem Catechism, right? Number one, right? The Messiah is the son of David. They know that. And then Jesus said to them, how is it then that David by the Spirit calls him Lord? In other words, calling the Messiah, the son of David, Lord saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under my, your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? How can David's son be greater than David and have David call him Lord? And they had no idea. They're like, uh, I don't get it. We're just leaving. And they left. They just couldn't respond. Okay, so Jesus is saying, as the Messiah, as the Son of Man, he is David's Lord. He is David's God. Number four, Jesus claims to be the heavenly son of God. You know that you hear all the time, right? Reading the the gospels and listening in mass. Jesus' favorite title is son of man, son of man, son of man, right? Remember this? Sounds familiar? What does that mean? Well, I'm going to explain that to you right now. At the very end of Christ's life, when when he's standing before the Sanhedrin, the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah? Like, let's just... Let's get to the point. Let's cut to the chase. Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus said, Yahweh. I am. There's actually some debate there. Did he meant like, I am, just a simple, yes, I am, such and such? Or Yahweh, I am. Now, I would, I subscribe to the school that he is saying Yahweh. He's saying, I am, because that's the question. Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? So it makes perfect sense to say, yeah, Yahweh, I am. Okay, And then he goes on to say, And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And all of them condemned him as deserving death. 
Again, notice the reaction. To, uh, look at the reaction to understand the claim. Jesus says, I am, and you will see the Son of Man coming and, uh, to receive power and coming on the clouds of heaven. What is he talking about? A lot of people think he is talking about um, well, the end of the world. But he's not talking about the end of the world because he says, you all will see. Like the people standing there will see this. So what is he doing? He is quoting one of the most famous prophecies in the Old Testament. Daniel chapter 7. And Daniel chapter 7 is filled with different visions. But we're focusing on the beginning of this one here. Okay, Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. Daniel writes, As I watched the night visions, I saw one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. Sound familiar? And he came to the ancient one and was, and was presented before him. To him was given dominion and glory and kingship that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away, and his kingship is one that shall not be destroyed. Now, Jesus is quoting this very passage to the high priest in the Sanhedrin. That's why they were just freaked out, tore their clothes, and condemned them as death. Because he's saying, yeah, I am the Son of Man, and you will see me take my kingdom. Can you, just, can you understand how powerful that would be? Now, here's the crazy thing. This is what's so ironic about Christianity. When did Jesus take possession of his kingdom? On the cross. He establishes the kingdom through his self-sacrifice. And did all of them see that? Yes, they did, but they didn't understand it. Okay? There's some other points about it as well. Uh, You know, the imagery of coming on the clouds is an imagery of condemnation. And so, this would take place in AD 70 when Jerusalem was destroyed. Okay, that was, this is, uh, go back to Isaiah and Jeremiah and other prophets. The Sanhedrin, a lot of them, certainly saw their city, their temple, being destroyed by the Roman legions. So there's a lot going on there. It's not the end of the world. It's Jesus saying, I am God, and you will see it proven. You follow me? All right, everybody. Now let's look at some implicit claims of divinity really quickly. Now we're at the top of page two. Now, Letter A, or number one, Jesus exalts himself above all created things. The hall of fame of the Old Testament. He says he's greater than Jonah, than Solomon, than Moses, than Elijah. He's greater even than the angels. He has command over the angels. Who can do this but God alone? Here is one passage for you as an example, just one, because we we don't have too much time. Jesus said, well, this is, of course, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus said to, to Peter, put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? Like, Jesus' control is, is master over everything and everybody. All right? Who but God has mastery over the angels? Okay? No one does. That is an implicit claim for divinity. He exalts himself above all created things. Number two, Jesus uses Old Testament images for God to refer to himself. One of the most beautiful and powerful moving images of God in the Old Testament is that of the bridegroom. Yahweh is Israel's bridegroom. Okay? Israel is his bride. Now, Jesus comes, and what does he call himself? The bridegroom. To me, that's explicit. If if, if I were a Jew listening to Jesus, let me just read this really quickly. Mark chapter 2, verse 19. Jesus said to them, The wedding guests cannot fast while the bridegroom is with them, can they? And as long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. Of course, this is in reference to the disciples of John saying, Well, why why do we fast? Why do the the disciples of the Pharisees fast? But your disciples don't fast. He said, Because I'm the bridegroom. I'm here. You don't fast in a wedding, do you? No. So, Jesus calls himself the bridegroom, and only God in the Old Testament was called the bridegroom. He calls himself, also, I have these all in your notes, he calls himself the Lord of the Sabbath. To me, that's explicit. Who is Lord of the Who created the Sabbath? God did. And he calls himself, in Matthew chapter 12, the Lord of the Sabbath. So, that's number two. He uses Old Testament images of God to refer to himself. Number three... Jesus makes demands that only God can make. I also find this very powerful. He makes demands of faith. He says, believe, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and believe in me. As if they're equal. Believe in God and believe in me at the same time. You don't have the same faith in human beings as you have in God. Amen? 
We have to trust each other to a certain extent, of course. But he makes demands of faith, but he also makes demands of love. Our relationship with God transcends everything else. Who but God can say this to another human person? Okay, Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. If Jesus says this and he's not God, I mean, where does he get off? Right? Amen? Where does he get off? Who can say that? That's powerful. It's because he's God. It's because he can say that. Number four, Jesus allows religious worship to be offered to him. Now, there's a difference. There's a normal human worship, so to speak. Okay? It's called dulia. It's in the Latin. It's an old Latin term, dulia. It means respect. It means honor. We give these to people who deserve it. Okay? Religious worship is latria. And Jesus accepts that religious worship. For example, after Jesus walks on the water and he calms all right, the waters, the wind, the storm that was developing, Jesus got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. That's religious worship. Also, don't forget doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas, he didn't believe he wanted to see Jesus himself. And Jesus said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out and put your hand into my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered him, it's beautiful, I got goosebumps. My Lord and my God. That's religious worship. Jesus didn't say, stop that. I'm just a man, like John does and other apostles do. No, he says, you have believed because you have seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet come to believe. So him accepting this religious worship as God is very powerful. Okay, number five. Jesus' miracles reveal his omnipotence. Now, we're not spending a lot of time, you know, doing an apologetics on miracles, because in my opinion, it flows. If Jesus is God, then miracles happen. Now, Jesus performs all these miracles that we know so well, but he appeals to the miracles as a reason of belief in him. He says, if I'm not doing the works of my Father, then don't believe me. But if I do do them, even though you do not believe me, believe in the works. So that you might know and understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Again, there is that explicit, I and the Father are one. And they tried to arrest him again, but he escaped from their hands. Powerful stuff. Believe in the works, and the works reveal that he is God. Number six, Jesus claims the power to forgive sins and redeem mankind. No one on God's green earth, no human being on God's green earth, can claim to forgive sins and redeem mankind. Only God can do that. So here in Mark chapter 2, Jesus sees the faith, right, the, the, some friends bring in this paralytic, right? And they saw their faith, and he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak this way? It's blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? See, that's the scandal, everybody. Look at the reactions time and time again from the Pharisees and the crowds. Jesus says, Your sins are forgiven. He said that no one can forgive sins but God alone. And they didn't believe he's God. And obviously he is, so he has the authority to say that, right? So it makes perfect sense. He claims the power to forgive sins. Finally, number seven, Jesus declares himself the judge of the whole world. And this is all over the place. He is the judge of the whole world. He will judge hearts, what is secret, what is hidden. He will bring everything into plain sight. And in John 5, he says so much. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, so that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Anyone, does not honor the, anyone who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Very truly I say to you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. So in other words, believe that I am God, believe in me, obey me, and your sins will be forgiven, and you will pass from death to life. Now, I know I went through those rather quickly, but we've seen here explicit, well, let me just put it, a number of different claims of divinity in different ways. Some are explicit, some are what Dr. Petrie says, implicit, all right? But I think a number of those are rather explicit, wouldn't you agree? I think so. So, no one can say Jesus didn't claim to be God. No one can say the Bible doesn't report Jesus to claim divinity. It's impossible. I just showed you 11 different ways. 
Now, we are forced to respond to this. We're forced to react. We're forced to, to make a decision, draw a conclusion. There are only five possible conclusions we can draw in all of this. And here I'm drawing from the insights given by uh, Kreft and Pacelli in their handbook on apologetics. Jesus is either Lord, he's either a liar, a lunatic, a guru, or it's all just a big fat lie, big fat myth. So are you all with me so far? All right, very, very good. Now, number one, quite simply, first option, Jesus is truly Lord, right? Here's Doubting Thomas again. He is truly Lord. He is truly God. But Jesus claimed to be God. He meant it. He was telling the truth. And we believe him because he's a good, wise, virtuous, loving, and trustworthy teacher. I mean, no one really walks around and says Jesus was a complete jerk. I mean, have you heard anyone say that? No, we, even if you don't believe Jesus is God, people say he's a good man. He's a good teacher, right? We should probably, it's the golden rule and, you know, kind of pick and choose what, you know, different sayings that Jesus had. So we believe him because he has the profile, the psychological profile, the virtue of, of someone believable. He performed miracles. He astounded and perplexed his contemporaries. He converted the hard hearted. All of these things. Show, yeah, Jesus meant what he said. He's God. That's the first option. But what if it's not? What if Jesus claimed to be God, but he lied about it? He'd be like Pinocchio here. All right? He'd be Pinocchio. I hope I'm not going to get into trouble for that. But um, I wasted like 45 minutes doing it. Yeah, an extra days in purgatory. But, but seriously, I mean, consider it. I mean, I think it's, it's perplexing because what if he did lie? What if he claimed to be God and lied about it? He wasn't God in any way, shape, or form. If he lied, then he cannot be a good man. Do you see that? No one lies about being God and they still remain a good man or a moral teacher or a prophet for that matter. You know, along the lines of, you know, Confucius, Muhammad, and Buddha and all the rest of them. If he's a liar, then he is one of the worst people in human history because he managed to dupe the majority of human history. He can't be not God and a good man at the same time because he claimed to be God. Now, Dr. Kreft gives three reasons, three simple reasons, why Jesus couldn't have lied, why he wasn't a liar. It's just something to think about and to chew on. Number one, he's got the complete wrong psychological profile, right? He's unselfish, as we saw. Nobody disagrees with this. He's unselfish, he's loving, he's caring, he's compassionate, he's passionate about teaching truth, helping others to, to, to truth. Now, liars, Dr. Kreft points out, Lie for selfish reasons, right? Don't people lie for selfish reasons? They want money, fame, pleasure, power. And Jesus didn't want any of that. He abandoned all of that. He even gave his life, all right, for, of course, other people as we understand it. So he's not a liar. He doesn't act like a liar. He doesn't talk like a liar. It's, that just doesn't, that, it doesn't jive. Number two, there's no possible, no conceivable motive for his lie. What did it bring him? It brought him hatred rejection, misunderstanding, persecution, torture, and ultimately death. He died a criminal's death, a painful death on the cross. Why would anybody lie just to go through that? I mean, remember that scene before the Sanhedrin, and the high priest says, are you the Messiah? Just tell me. I mean, if he, he knows he's going to be condemned to death. It'd be a good time to finally, if he was lying, it'd be a good time right then to say, you know what? No, I'm not. I'm not the Messiah. Let me go. No, no one follows through like that, unless, of course, he's telling the truth. Number three, he couldn't have hoped that his lie would be successful. Why? Because the Jews were the least likely people in the world to have worshipped a man, and Jesus, as a Jew, knew that. The Jews had this complete, clear conception that God is transcendent. He is separate from creation. No one, no human being can ever claim to be God and get away with it. So he couldn't possibly believe that his lie would work. You see those three reasons? All right, so that's something to chew on, to think about. What about him being a lunatic? I found this great comic here just to kind of lighten things up a bit. This says here, it's from um, reverendfun.com. It says, let's look at him. He totally thinks he's God's gift to the world, right? It's kind of funny. It's kind of cute. Um, but what if he's a lunatic? What if he, yeah, he, we saw that he claimed to be God. What if he really believed it but wasn't God? Right? There are plenty of people in insane asylums. I mean, C.S. Lewis ultimately pointed out this trilemma here. There are plenty of people in insane asylums, and C.S. Lewis's words were, who think they're poached eggs, right? Who, who think they're the Messiah, who think they're God. Is it possible that Jesus just thought he was divine? Okay? 
No, it's not, for a couple of different reasons. Number one, again, the wrong psychological profile. A lunatic, has anybody ever met a lunatic, by the way? Like a real lunatic? No? A couple of people? Interesting. All right, I'd like, like to know maybe the circumstances of that later. But, you know, uh, we, know, we don't really need a lunatic too often. But a lunatic, I think you would understand and agree, lacks the very qualities that shine in Jesus, Dr. Kreft points out. Practical wisdom, tough love, unpredictable creativity. Jesus didn't walk around like the other lunatics described in the scripture, hitting himself with stones and blabbering and salivating everywhere, foaming at the mouth. All right? Not that all lunatics act that way, of course, but he, has the, he didn't act like a lunatic. He didn't speak like a lunatic. Number two, people didn't react to him as if he were a lunatic. When we meet a lunatic, we're uncomfortable because we feel superior to him. We pity him, right? When the enemies met, his enemies met Jesus, they were uncomfortable for the opposite reason. A lunatic doesn't make you feel personally challenged, only embarrassed and eventually bored. Jesus challenged people. He, he caused them to reflect on who he was, on who they are. He caused them to repent of their sins. He healed people. You're right? He moved people's emotions. Lunatics don't do that. You feel weird around lunatics. And that's why I asked. I want to see if you guys you know, agree to that. It's just it's very unsettling. And that Jesus didn't have that reaction. Finally, number three, again, no Jew would, could sincerely think he was God. No, it's just impossible. No group in history was less likely to confuse the creator with a creature than the Jews. And the only people who had an absolute, absolutely clear distinct, a distinction between the divine and the human. If Jesus was insane, he probably wouldn't be going around saying he was Yahweh. Okay? He wouldn't have lasted that long. He wouldn't be able to escape her. You just think about these things and see how it doesn't work. So those are the first three. He claimed to be God. Either he was, or he lied about it, or he thought he was God, but really wasn't. Lord, liar, lunatic. What about a fourth option? What if he was a guru? This is actually becoming more and more popular. Have you ever heard this before? Jesus was a guru, an Eastern spiritual guru. Sounds funny even coming out of my mouth. Jesus realized, in other words, his own inner divinity. He realized that we're all God, and he was trying to teach us that we're all divine too. We've got to realize our own inner divinity. So he was just simply a, a mystic, an enlightened spiritual master in the Eastern tradition. And actually, to be consistent, some people have even written that before his public ministry, he went off to Asia somewhere to learn about Eastern mysticism, and then came back to try to teach people that we're all divine. Well, no, no, this is before he was 30, right? Somewhere, somewhere between he's 12 and 30. All right, that's one claim anyways. Now, why isn't this possible? Well, number one, again, Jesus is a Jew. He is a Jewish man who walked, taught, believed like a Jewish rabbi. All right? He claimed to fulfill the law and the prophets. He says that explicitly, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. He came to fulfill the law and the prophets. He never knew about Eastern religions, at least not in his human knowledge, his experiential knowledge. He never went to Asia. He had no idea what they, in his, again, in his human knowledge, uh, taught. He was deeply rooted in Jewish religion, Jewish culture, Jewish thought. And the differences between Judaism and e- Eastern religion, Eastern spirituality are incredibly stark. Okay? So if he thought this, by the way, if he really realized his inner divinity was trying to teach his apostles this, he failed miserably. Failed miserably because no one, the apostles, the, anyone listening to him in the first century, the early church fathers, no one understood him to be an Eastern mystic, mystical guru. Okay? I wanted to share a couple of different things with you that I got from uh, Dr. Kreft, comparing Judaism with Eastern spiritual spirituality, religious spirituality. Now, I want to give one caveat here. This is, you know, a lot of these comparisons, especially with Eastern spirituality, are a bit of a generalization. They are common practices, common beliefs among Eastern religions. All right, yes, there, if you want to go into the details of like Buddhism and how it compares with Hinduism and some of the other Asian religions, you're going to find some, distingu- some differences. But this is a, an overview, a general overview of Eastern religious thought. Okay, So as we're going through this, you might think, oh, well, well, that's not necessarily true with Buddhism. Well, you might be right, depending on what you're thinking of. But again, it's an overview. So I wanted to give that caveat here just to compare Judaism with Eastern spirituality. Do you understand that? All right. So it's a safe generalization. Number one, 
Again, this is all to show the contrast between Judaism and Eastern religion. Jesus could never have been a guru according to Eastern mysticism. Judaism is a public religion. It's with got a public law, public scriptures, written scriptures, expressed in human language. All right, everything is public about Judaism. The rituals, the laws, everything. Eastern mysticism, taken as a whole, is private. It's individual. It's eternal. And it can't be expressed in human language. It's impossible to, to, to lay out exactly what, um, well, this mysticism is in human language because human language is, is feeble. Number two, God is transcendent in Judaism and utterly distinct from creation. All right, he is dist- creation and God are completely separate. God created the world and God is a person. That's what's crazy about Judaism, believing that God is a person. Generally, in Eastern spirituality, God is pantheistic. In other words, God is in everything, right? God is eminent in everything. He's not a person. Personhood is an illusion. It's not real. You've got to to transcend the, the illusion of being a person in order to realize the divinity within yourself. Make sense? Number three. In Judaism, time, matter, history, space, all these things are real, good, and created by God. Real, good, and created by God. Salvation consists in God redeeming his people in history, okay? In Eastern spirituality, generally speaking, time, matter, history, space, they're all an illusion. Now, obviously, this is a different. Buddha thought that things were real, right? Suffering was real. But, again, generally speaking, these things are an illusion. Salvation is to be free from time and history and space, right? Salvation is to realize the inner divinity within you. Going on a couple more different points. In Judaism, God is active. He pursues man. Remember the image of the bridegroom. God loves us. He pursues us as a bridegroom. He reveals himself to us. And Judaism is a historical religion. All right? In Eastern spirituality, God is passive. He doesn't pursue us. He's completely unknowable except through mystical experience only. You've got to go aside. That's what Buddha did, actually. And you know, he had to go under the tree for 40 days. And, well, I won't get into his story. But you know, you've, got, you've got to realize that a divinity inside you within, with mystical experience. Because God is not known. He doesn't reveal himself in history. In Judaism, God is moral. He's righteous. He's holy. In Eastern spirituality, generally, again, generally speaking, there's no will, no law, no morality. Okay, at least clear-cut morality. In Judaism, there's a final judgment. There is a judgment. There is a heaven. There is a, a hell. Not so in Eastern spirituality. You keep reincarnating. You keep reincarnating. You keep reincarnating. Thousands and thousands of times if necessary. And finally, in Judaism, there is objective truth. Clear, hard, objective truth. Moral truth. Not so in Eastern spirituality. And again, there's some, you know... Educated men can differ, as the uh, expression goes. There are some differences there. But as a whole, that's the distinction. So Jesus, as a Jew, would never try to, to teach inner divinity along these lines. It's completely foreign to him as a Jew. Does that make sense? That's the point that Dr. Kreft is trying to, trying to share with us. Now, let's move on for the sake of time and look at the fifth and final possibility. That Jesus is a myth. Has anybody, did anybody see this the past uh, Christmas season? And I think it was Times Square, New York. Atheist.org put up this big sign, okay? Keep the, keep the merry, dump the myth. Go online, just go, just go on to their website. They got all kinds, they've got a massive campaign to discredit the, his, the historical credibility of the Gospels, to discredit Jesus Christ. He's a myth, he's something made up. By the apostles themselves, perhaps, or by some Christian community. So this is, I mean, we're in the middle of a culture war for sure. And there's a, it caused a big scandal. People said you got to take it down. But, you know, it's freedom of speech. I mean, you have to just admit it. They have every right to put up any billboard they want to. All right? Just as we would, of course, put up a sign about Christ. So anyways, is it a myth? Is it a lie? And if so, how? Why? For what purpose? Now, the apostles, let's go first themselves couldn't possibly have lied for a couple of reasons. They're very similar to the reasons we saw in Jesus. Number one, there's no motive. Really, I mean, why would you lie? What's the point? For what purpose? They were persecuted and killed for this so quote-unquote lie, for their gospel. Christianity wasn't legal until 313. So, yes, they weren't completely persecuted. There's on-again, off-again persecutions, but those on-again times were pretty brutal. There's no point. They have no fame, no fortune, no power, no pleasure, none of that. Why would they possibly lie? 
Number two, they couldn't have been successful, like Jesus, right? The idea of God becoming incarnate was ridiculous to the Gentiles. I got a great quote in a little bit about that. It was ridiculous, God becoming, you know, man. And to this, it was a scandal to the Jews, as we saw. That's why they crucified Jesus. So there's no motive for the apostles to lie, or the early Christians, for that matter. Secondly, the authenticity, right? The credibility of the Gospels themselves stand up much better under scientific, what's called literary criticism, like critiquing the literary forms. They stand up much better than any other ancient document. And this literary criticism, the scientific method here for ancient documents, show that internal, that means evidence within the text, and external evidence outside of the Bible, shows that these Gospels and the New Testament in general were written in the first century. Most of them before the year 70 AD, one generation within Christ's time. They were written by eyewitnesses of Jesus, like Matthew and John, or by disciples of the eyewitnesses, like Mark and Luke. Mark hung out with Peter, like buddies, like pals, like two peas in a pod. In fact, Mark's gospel is known as Peter's gospel. Mark just simply wrote down what Peter taught. And Luke, of course, did an incredible, I'm going to point out in a second here, he did incredible research. He hung out with Paul and met with Mary and so on and so forth. So the authenticity uh, and the credibility of the gospels really... Is quite solid, okay? It's quite airtight. Let me give you a couple examples. Internal evidence within the text itself. The literary style, you know, there are different literary genres, right? Poetry, or you're going to talk about, you know, parables, or sometimes there is legitimate myth, okay? So on and so forth. But the Gospels themselves were not written in the literary style of myth, they were written in the literary style of eyewitness history. That's how it was written. For example, The apostles tell us they're writing the truth. They tell us they're writing history. And that goes back to the initial quote that I had from the catechism. We have a historical faith. Okay? So Luke chapter 1 begins his gospel much in the same way as other pagan writers. Right? they got a beautiful, elegant prologue stating that they're writing history. And so... Luke simply tells Theophilus here, he says, Since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided, after investigating everything carefully from the first, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed. So he's saying, look, I'm writing history, and I've done meticulous research and investigation about it, Theophilus, so that you might know the truth about which you have been instructed. In other words, you might know more of the truth about what you received in catechism class. (laughs) All right? St. John, in his epistle, 1 John, he opens up along the same lines, convincing everybody of the historical reality of Jesus and his claim of divinity. Paul, uh, Paul, excuse me, John says, We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we've looked at, and what we have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it, and we testify to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also might have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Does that sound like the beginning of a myth story to you? Someone who says, I've seen Him, I've heard Him, I've touched Him, I've slept, you know, and walked with Him, I've been with Him thick and thin, day in, day out for three years. And we want you to have fellowship with the Father and the Son as well. These are eyewitness accounts, okay? That's, in, that's an example of internal evidence, an example of external evidence, all right? Copies of the New Testament. We have more copies of the New Testament than any other historical document. Any other historical document. The thousands of copies that we have have only minor discrepancies, and only a handful of them. And we're talking like a vowel is missing kind of a thing. Nothing like, gosh... This copy says, Jesus says, I am, and this copy doesn't. Well, which is it? Nothing major, nothing at all. They're so consistent, so reliable amongst them. So I want to give you a chart here from another um, book that I uh, recommend. Well, did I recommend? I don't think I did. It's called um, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. There's a little chart here comparing the New New Testament copies with the best ancient document that we have. So first, and that, of course, is the Iliad. 
the best thing that compares to what we have in the New Testament is from the Iliad. The date written was probably more or less around 900 B.C. The earliest copy we have is 400 B.C. And the time span was, that's roughly 500 years. How many copies do we have of the Iliad? 643. That's, that's pretty good, right? The New Testament, on the other hand, was written roughly 40 to 100 A.D. The earliest copy we have, 125 A.D., that's a t- time span of 25 years. We have over 24,000 different copies, and they're all consistent, give or take a vowel, <laughs> kind of a thing, okay? Now, you might think, well, the, the Iliad, that's, that's a long time. That's, you know, if it was th- written 900, roughly, you know, 1,000 years before Jesus, but that's the best we have. Other, like, Latin documents don't even, they're not even, they're worse than that. So, it's pretty incredible, the external evidence that we have about the copies of the New Testament. Here's another example of external evidence. Many early, and I mean early, like, so this is, you know, within the first century or so, people who either, in the first century, of course, they either saw Jesus or saw eyewitnesses of Jesus. There are secular historians making accounts or giving accounts of Jesus Christ and his claims to divinity. And, as I said, ridiculing it. There is a Roman, Pliny, okay, who wrote, an emp- uh, wrote a letter to Emperor Trajan. This is what he said. This is a, a, a Roman giving an account of this whole concept of Christianity. So he's writing to, uh, to the emperor and he says, I asked them directly if they were Christians. Those who persisted, I ordered away. Those who denied they were or ever had been Christians worshipped both your image and the images of the gods and cursed Christ. They used to gather on a stated day before dawn to sing to Christ as if he were a god. By the way, what stated day might that be to get together and sing to Christ? Say maybe, yeah, Sunday? Exactly. To, To sing to Christ as if he were a god. All the more I believed it necessary to find out what the truth from the two servant maids, which were called deaconesses, by means of torture. Nothing more did I find than a disgusting, fanatical superstition. What's he think about Christianity, right? Therefore, I stopped the examination and hastened to consult you on account of the number of people endangered. For many of all ages, all classes, and both sexes already are brought into danger. This is right after the turn of the century, okay? This is a Roman leader giving an account of what Christians believe. All right? How is that possible? Unless, of course, they believed it. So my last point I have for you as we're coming to a conclusion is, if this were a myth purported by the apostles or some early Christian community or later Christian community for that matter, we should be able to find other accounts, other documents refuting the claim that Jesus said he was divine. Do you understand? We should find some sort of evidence somewhere saying, no, Jesus never claimed to be God. This was made up. Such and such a person introduced this. We never find that. The only problems that we have in the early century, in two couple centuries, is that people disputed the claim's credibility, not the existence. Everybody knew that people worshipped Christ as God, that he claimed to be God. I got here on your notes other Secular authors as well. Tacitus, Josephus, Lucian, Suetonius, and so on and so forth. The claim, no one doubted the existence, but people doubted the credibility, like our pal Pliny here. All right? It's impossible. How could God, could God become man? All right? Does that make sense? So we've done a lot of work. We've covered a lot of ground this, mor- this morning. <laughs> it's been a long day. This evening. All right? We saw, of course, explicit and implicit claims to divinity, and we saw the only five possible alternatives to this claim. He's either truly Lord, a liar, a lunatic, possibly a guru, or it's all a big fat myth. And hopefully, briefly, I explained to you that the only, the only option really is that he is Lord. Consider the options. Consider the alternatives. All right? And I, you know, chew on it this, this coming week um, as you're praying and whatnot. We have to make a decision of who Jesus is. Who do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And we have to make a decision. If he's truly God, our lives can be transformed. Lives can be healed. But you've got to surrender. That's the problem, right? What is it going to cost me? Well, kind of everything. That's what Christianity is. It's going to cost you everything. But we're good for it. So I'm going to leave you with one passage, and then I want to get to questions, okay? So this is John chapter 3, verse 16, a famous passage. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, 
so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the gospel. Jesus is God. And so we are, in the next three weeks, going to study his life so we could come to know him more and love him more. And next week is the mysteries of our Lord's infancy and hidden life. Isn't that beautiful image right there? Love that image, right? Jesus is a little, you know, white boy with blonde curly hair, right? Um, Probably not, but it's still very beautiful. Now, especially since I'm having a boy in four weeks, you know, I kind of like that. But, uh, yeah, so that's what we're going to study next week. Um, I do have small group discussions, but I see a couple of hands were up. So um, we'll open up to some Q&A.